Hello, everyone. I am uh, Claudine Murgan, the host of the Spiritual Inspired Show. And uh, my guest uh, today is uh, Lorna Liana. She's a media strategist and online business coach to visionary entrepreneurs. For the past six years, she built her business traveling the world as a digital nomad, living in Thailand, Bali, Mexico, Brazil, Costa Rica, Hawaii, and Spain. Prior to becoming a location independent internet entrepreneur, she worked as an online marketer in San Francisco, specializing in social media, SEO, and community development through social web technology. Lorna is a 20-year practitioner of shamanism with extensive training in Tibetan born shamanism and experience exploring the Ayahuasca traditions in the Amazon basin. In 2004, she had a life-changing experience in the Brazilian Amazon, which has evolved into many long-term return visits as a guest of the indigenous tribes of Ecuador, Peru, and Brazil over the past decade. She is also the founder of the Antion Nation. Lorna, thank you very much for, for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. It's truly a pleasure and a deep honor. Um, as you said, you're a nomad uh, and usually ask my, uh, my clients, how did they, they start uh, and when did they start their spiritual journey? Gosh, you know, uh, well, spiritual journey probably before I became a nomad. But let me say that um, it was my time in Brazil as a guest of the Hunaquin community in uh, the Jordan area, where I received the spark of inf inspiration to become... I don't know, uh, uh, to become free from a location-based job. So I was um, living in a community for some time, uh, different communities in Brazil. And uh, while I was drinking ayahuasca with the Huna Queen, and then later with the Santo Daime community of Mapia, um, I started to really open up my intuitive channels and receive a message from around the forest that was basically saying, Lorna, your mission is to leverage, master and leverage emerging technologies so that emerging technologies can be used to preserve ancient wisdom so that ancient wisdom can benefit the modern world. And little did I know that would set me up for a lifetime of adventure and my career as a full stack internet marketer. But at that moment, all I knew was that I needed to figure out a way to be able to generate income online so I could keep going back to Brazil and spending long stretches of time in the Amazon. What I didn't know at that time was the challenges of working on Line in the Amazon. Yes, indeed. Yeah, with little internet and uh, you know connectivity and all that good stuff. Yes, well, it's it was actually possible because when I went back to the Amazon many years later in 2011, that was my fr I had a career, a whole corporate career in high tech in San Francisco. Learned a lot of things around uh, uh, social technologies, and then I finally, when I cut the umbilical cord to my corporate job, I went. The first thing I did, I went back to the Amazon, went back to Brazil, but this time I had a um, a consultancy specializing in search engine marketing for, at that time, predominantly um, green tech, so solar technology clients. And I literally managed my uh, campaigns, my SEO campaigns, um, from using my laptop in the deep, deep jungle, using a really terrible satellite dish that was installed at the last village on the Rio Breo. Uh, the last village was the name, uh, went by the name of Jacobina. Jacobina was the last village. And um, yeah, it was in a shotgun shack that was created as a punto de, cul de cultura, a, a cultural point or cultural station um, that was an initiative of the Brazilian government to uh, basically provide some access to computer technology, internet, um, uh, some books about indigenous culture, maps, things like that. So some of these villages had 
essentially access to internet through satellite. They had computers there, some of which worked, some of which didn't work. Um, and so I literally tried to use this really terrible uh, internet connection to manage my, um, my team who were based in the United States to be able to finish the campaign for our client. And it was able to get them number one ranking for a very competitive solar keyword. Um, but that was kind of a, a moment of, um, you know, many people talk about their moment of success in online business. And for many, it's, you know, the achievement of certain revenue goals or having achieved passive income or a six figure launch. Uh, but for me, it was being able to rank my, my solar client number one for their top keyword in the middle of the jungle using a satellite dish. Nice, nice. And, you know, usually when people think of um, doing plant medicine or traveling to um, South America, the first uh, country that comes to, to their mind is either Peru or Chile. So why Brazil for you? Well, gosh, it ended up being that I had originally purchased a ticket to attend a retreat. Um, I think it was at Eduardo Luna's retreat center but it was in like Bahia or something. And Dennis McKenna was going to be there. And there was like a, a psychologist. It was one of those classic, you know, psychotherapist, ayahuasca, but we're going to try to make it, you know, kind of like a retreat getaway experience. And, uh, and then I got busy with work and then I couldn't go. And so I didn't go to the retreat, but I still had this ticket, right? And I didn't want to lose the ticket. So I was just wondering, I was like, well, where on earth do I go? And so at that point, I met my friend who had written, but this is before he published his book, The Jaguar That Roams the Mind. His name is Robert Tyndall. Um, so he was in the throes of writing a book about his journey in Brazil. And he specifically went to Acre to explore the ayahuasca uh, traditions in Acre, and um, and so I met him in an ayahuasca ceremony in in Marin, where he turned into a jaguar in the middle of the session, and then later on, you know, I connected with him, and he was like, "You should go to Brazil, but you know, don't you know, don't go to don't go to you know some other place. Go to Acre." So I ended up going instead. So I, I took a sabbatical off because I was burnt out for my nonprofit career. At that point, I spent 10 years in nonprofits, you know, lots of energy, you know, not enough strategy, overwork, underpaid. And so I was like, you know, I can't keep working like this. And so I went to Brazil, uh, finally, and took a one month sabbatical, so that I could, you know, get clear and figure out what I wanted to do. And so I went to Florianopolis. And mind you, this was after maybe um, about nine months of drinking ayahuasca, but an analog of ayahuasca. It was a really potent brew of ayahuasca, chacruna, um, um, Syrian rue, and mimosa that was being served in a uh, closed circle in Marin, and, which was one of the ones that Robert dropped into. And, um, and so, you know, after nine months of that, I was like, you know, I really do need to connect with the authentic living wisdom, the, the medicine, the, the living medicine tradition. And so I went to Brazil, but it was kind of like I went to Florianopolis for a month. And so was there and was like, OK, well, you know, well, well, I was there for two weeks. I planned to go to Brazil for a month. And I was in this I was in this um, youth hostel that was run by an Argentinian guy. And I was trying to figure out, I was like, well, I got two more weeks here. I feel complete with Florianopolis. Do I hang out here for the rest of the month? I'm having a good time. Or do I try to go to Acre, to Rio Branco for two weeks? Just, you know, not a lot of time. And so as I'm journaling outside at night underneath the uh, moonlit sky, it's quiet. There's, I was the only guest at this guest house. It was off season. And then something, compelled me to look up from my the picnic table that I was in just you know there was no sound or anything I just looked up and I saw a snake come up the stairs silently and it was you know slithering its way up the stairs and it came straight for the picnic table and I at that point got up and backed away and then that snake essentially curled up right where my feet was and I looked at the snake and I sketched it in my journal and I could see it was a poisonous snake because I had a triangular head, but I didn't recognize the snakes of, um, of Brazil. 
And so in the morning, and then I saw the snake, you know, I kind of like threw some twigs at it, but it didn't do anything. And, and then finally it moved and then it slithered into like the key, the snack kiosk. And so then in the morning I talked to the, the um, hostel owner. I was like, Hey, you know, I saw this snake and I don't know what it is, but it went into your, you know, breakfast area. And I showed him a picture. He's like, that is an extremely deadly snake. You know, if that snake bit you, you would have an hour to get the anti-venom or you would die. It is called the Jararaca. Mm -hmm. And it is just one of the most deadly snakes in Brazil, in the world. In fact, I'm like, Oh my God. Wow. I wouldn't have even, if I had, hadn't even thought, had the intuition to look up, it made no sound because totally stepped on it because it curled up right where my feet were. So I found it a bit like a sign. And so at that point, I you know got online and started writing my friend Robert, who was at that time uh, spending a year with, with his partner, um, Susana, um, Susana Bustos, who is a faculty member at the California Institute of Integral Studies. She was doing her PhD studying the um, uh, vegetalismo um, tradition in Peru, and they were literally uh, uh, on the other side of the um, Corridera in, um, in Pucal, out, well, outside of Pucalpa, staying with their maestro Juan Flores Salazar in his center called Mayantuyaku. And, you know, they're normally off grid, but for whatever bizarre reason, at that moment, Robert was also online in Rio Branco at the same time I was emailing him. And this was before um, instant messaging existed, actually. So it was kind of in like the earlier 2000, like 2007-ish, maybe, I want to, like 2005, I, I, 2005, it was 2004, 2004-ish. And it was 2004, yes. And so then, um, so we're emailing back and forth in real time. And he is like, Lorna, snakes have medicine, go to Rio Branco. Hmm. I'm like, okay. Okay, snakes have medicine, go to Rio Branco. And so what's interesting, so I, I took that flight to Rio Branco and then that, um, that trip to Rio Branco ended up um, extending into four months. I gave notice via email and extended my sabbatical to four months in Brazil. And interestingly enough, that, that snake, the, Yarara, the Jararaca, um, its venom was actually used for medicine. Um, it's venom is a, a powerful anticoagulant. So when people die from its venom, they die because they bleed out. They, they bleed out it, like it. Um, um, yeah, it prevents blood from clotting and people hemorrhage, essentially. Uh, this is based on my memory of what, how you die. It's not a very pleasant death. And, uh, but the anticoagulant properties of the venom was actually, um, um, extract has is actually extracted and used uh in as an anticoagulant that you can find in most hospitals around the world mm -hmm. so that snake indeed had medicine um so i found that really interesting and so yeah and so then i set an intention and you know one coincidence after another doors opened and then i found myself being invited to uh go to an epic um Queen of Queen Festival, and then I stayed on in Mapia, and it was just a really powerful experience that I will always deeply remember. It made me a per the person that I am, and it really introduced me to the incredible um, power and intelligence of the master plants. Beautiful. And you mentioned about the message you received on your first uh, trip to, um, to the jungle. Has that message changed over the years? You know, what's really interesting, that message has been like a North Star for me. And so as I follow that message, it has changed in many ways. And my relationship with that message, I also find it to be a spiritual inquiry as well. Because sometimes as I follow that North Star, sometimes my relationship with that message becomes out of balance. And so this is what I would um, share with the audience for people who feel mission driven and purpose, you know, who are following their soul purpose. It is a delicate balance of living a life beyond regrets and following your true soul's purpose, but not following it in such a way where it causes harm and damage to yourself. And so in my life journey since the 2004, I would say that that mission 
fundamentally changed something in my life. It gave my life a profound sense of meaning and adventure. I think I would have been a very different person had I not received that very clear message that the plant medicine, that Madre Ayahuasca opened up for me. And, um, and I hope to continue to follow that message in whatever form it shows up in. But in the years that I followed this message, different expressions of that soul purpose have unfolded for me that have been incredibly interesting and profound. And in some cases, I notice when my relationship with that mission becomes out of balance, I become overworked, I become rigid, I become, um, um, you know, hard on myself. And I can be, and being hard and unforgiving on myself and on other people as well, because then the mission becomes everything. Then it becomes a little fanatical in a, in a way, you know, and, and that is like the delicate balance. Because when you think about people that are very on fire around their missions, they can be charis charismatic leaders and they can also be cult leaders that are very dangerous mm -hmm. to the people that are in their audience. And so, um, so yeah, yeah, I, I look at that and, um, and try to maintain balance and peace of mind and, you know, take care of myself and would encourage people to, to do, explore what that means for them and what um, a healthy pursuit of their sole purpose looks like. Yeah, so in other words, when they receive such <clears throat> messages, they have to trust that it comes from, they come from the source. So they have to just let go and have faith that um, everything will be provided for them. And that's very hard for some of us because we are not going to be in control anymore. Or this is the, the mindset that we are not in control if we let go. And it's a very scary thought. It is kind of interesting. I, I think, you know, a lot of spiritual folks, because I think also in many traditional spiritual, in many spiritual traditions, there's almost a, a war against the ego. And I do question that war against annihilating the ego as a spiritual pursuit. I feel that the ego can be a powerful tool as well, but it's important to have a healthy relationship with your ego. And I think where the balance of letting, there's a balance of surrender mm -hmm. and allowing the divine intelligence to come through. And then there is the um, ego that wants it to look a certain way. And when you become attached to whatever it is that you're pursuing, looking a certain way, that's when the ego starts taking over. And then that's where the balance can start to become off balance. Yes, true. Yeah. Yeah. Luna, some of my um, guests, you know, they got attached to, to their traveling um, South America. They got attached to either Colombia or Ecuador or Peru. You've been to so many countries. Uh, which one stuck to your heart? Gosh, I would say my favorite countries are Brazil, Nepal, and Thailand, and for very different reasons. Um, hmm. Nepal is just breathtakingly beautiful. I it, the the heart, the foundation of my spiritual practice and ethos comes from Tibetan Buddhism. And so Tibetan Buddhism is very strong in Nepal. So when I have been there, I really have resonated with that part of myself and the culture, the spiritual arts and culture of Tibet and Nepal. And then Brazil is kind of like that fiery love affair. Mm -hmm. You it's that, lo that, that lover that you have that you're crazy about, but then you, you, you also simultaneously can't stand, right? So there's aspects of Brazil that make being there really difficult, the infrastructure or lack thereof. And if you're used to things being efficient and working in a certain way, it doesn't really do that in Brazil. 
And so that can be frustrating. And so Brazil can teach you patience, but then there's aspects of Brazil that are just beautiful, not found anywhere in the world. I really appreciate the, the vibe, the, the cultural vibe of how important it is for, that everybody feels good. Mm -hmm. Um, when I compare it to America, it's like, you know, that, that, that shit gets done. Like in, in Western cultures, it can be the, the, the cultural values are around things working, people making money, and uh, there being success. In Brazil, it's not so important that something is successful. It's more important that everybody's having a great time while doing it. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciated that about Brazil. Um, Thailand is just another delightful place. It's a place where I could imagine growing old. It's, um, yeah, the Buddhism there is, is beautiful. The temples, um, the food, the people. Yeah, yes. so many places. Thank you, Thank you for sharing that. that. Uh, and you mentioned um, <clears throat> Tibetan uh, Buddhism. So um, what is Tibetan-born shamanism? And how did you get um, involved deeper into it? So Bon is the, um, the native indigenous uh, religion or spirit, sh uh, shamanic spirituality of Tibet. And when Buddhism came over from India in about roughly the ninth century, then that's when, you know, it was interesting, my, my Tibetan uh, Bun teacher, uh, Tenzin Wangil Rinpoche, uh, I remember him saying in one of the retreats, he's like, you know, the Buddhists did to the Tibetans what the Chinese, you know, did to like, um, so, uh, so basically when the Buddhists came over from India to Tibet, then there was also some, you know, I believe there was, there, there were, you know, purges, there was killing there. I mean, it, it's, it's interesting. I mean, I don't, you don't really hear that in um, the spiritual, you don't really come across that in the spiritual text, but I found it interesting when he said that in one of the retreats and I, and I had actually thought about it like that, but you know, when a major religion moves into another region, uh, you know, often what happens is there is an oppression of the people that are there and the people that are there are forced to take on the new powers beliefs. So in something around around the ninth century, Buddhism came to Tibet and the first school of um, Tibetan Buddhism was uh, the Nyingma lineage. And then eventually the four other schools emerged at different time frames. And um, but the Bun tradition is the one that is most close to its um, shamanic roots. And, uh, and so from my understanding is that, you know, many of the, um, the deities that, that you find in Tibetan Buddhism were actually, you know, bun elemental deities. Mm -hmm. And so there's, uh, in the bun shamanic tradition, there are, you know, focuses, um, around shamanic practices. They have their own soul retrieval practice. Um, they have practices working with the energies of the five elements. Um, each of those elements has a deity that represents those elements, like the dakinis of the five elements um, that also are associated with a particular wisdom in uh, uh, Tibetan Buddhism. Um, there are Dharma protectors that are that look like scary demons, but that have been um, that have been tamed in order to protect the Dharma and those that pra uh, practice the Dharma. And uh, and so a lot of the you know what's what's unique about Buddhist Tibetan Buddhist iconography is has its roots in Bun shamanism. And do they so, use specific plant medicine, or is just about <laughs> playing with the energies and um, doing certain rituals? So a lot of the there what when I was immersed in Tibetan Buddhism, there was not any discussion or conversation or teachings that I came across that talked about psychoactive plants. Not to say that they didn't exist. Um, in the particular schools and sanghas that I, you know, was a part of uh, when I was in, immersed in Buddhist practice, there wasn't a focus on that. Um, yeah, that, that was not part of what we were studying. 
there could be, or there could be references in some of the ancient texts. I, I wouldn't know, but there, when you, when you dive into some of the teachings though, some of the teachings really do seem quite psychedelic. Um, and so one of the things that I, that actually inspired me to explore ayahuasca and psychedelic medicines was the fact that I had a foundation in Tibetan Buddhism. Many of the Tibetan tankas look rather psychedelic to me. And, um, and so, yeah, and so then when I got immersed into plant medicine shamanism, there was a, a natural, a, a conscious synergy, I would say. They're very highly compatible when you think about it because the practices that you would cultivate as a Tibetan Buddhist practitioner. So in my opinion, the people that have the most, some of the most profound understanding of the different levels of human consciousness and how deep we can go would be the Tibetan masters of meditation. They have different words that describe different meditation states and different types of wisdom that come from different realizations, so to speak. And when you start to cultivate your faculty for recognizing those mind states, it becomes very useful when you are navigating the interdimensional realms that open up when you are working with psychedelic medicines. And I would say that when you cultivate that foundation, it becomes more easeful to travel more deeply and to have interesting experiences in these bardo states. I mean, they're, they're bardo states in a way. They're the interdimensional intermediary states where people go in, the, uh, um, in shamanic journeys with these plant medicines would be an equivalent of the different bardos in Tibetan Buddhism. Yes, interesting. And um, touching on the um, uh, plant medicine, which one, after so much experience, which one, which plant um, has uh, more impact on you um, and which one react or you are fond of after so many years of experiencing maybe, you know, San Pedro, Ayahuasca, um, any other plant you, you use? Well, for me personally, I would say my main plant teacher would be ayahuasca. I also greatly appreciate the wisdom of the sacred mushrooms. And yeah, hmm. I, I think, you know, it's interesting. I have um, friends who are in my greater medicine family that just absolutely love peyote and that's their primary medicine. And I never felt like I had such a easeful relationship with grandfather peyote. Mm -hmm. um, so I think at the end of the day, it's, it can be a very personal energetic vibration or frequency as to which plant is your primary teacher. And I also think that sometimes there's different phases in your life where one teacher has more prominence in their relation your in their relationship with you or your relationship with them yeah that's an interesting idea i honestly i never thought of that because for me grandfather is very subtle i mean i don't have much experience with it but it's very subtle compared to you know mushrooms or ayahuasca so um yes i will i'll keep that in mind and i will monitor myself moving forward to see how that relationship will, will change. Interesting. Thank you. Uh, going back to your mission, um, which we talked about at the beginning, did you turn it into concrete um, results? Have you been able to you know, preserve the indigenous traditions by leveraging technology? I feel like it's an ongoing journey. So I feel that that journey for which I'm deeply grateful has allowed me to have a career in that involves the use of digital media and um, internet technologies. With regards to preserving ancient wisdom, I think I have more work to do in that regard. I 
do wish to use my platform to be able to elevate and center Indigenous perspectives um, whenever I can. And for in that, in that goal or in that regard, I've hosted some Indigenous wisdom keepers um, in my events and then also in my you know, master classes. And so I do hope to continue doing that. Some of the challenges that can come up are um, the translation and uh, um, video production challenges that can come across, uh, that we can uh, come across with that regard. So I feel that there's more work that I could do. I have a lot of video interview footage that still really needs to be translated. And the interesting challenges around translating indigenous elders and wisdom keepers sharing their knowledge in a language that is not their first language. So um, many of the Pages that I know when they speak Portuguese, it is not easy for a generic or a mainstream Portuguese translator to even understand what they're saying. So you do have to work with somebody who is their advocate, somebody who is a person that is a that is committed to being their ally who will accompany the indigenous when they go to conferences and gatherings and, and appear in, in media opportunities to advocate for them, to um, translate to them what is happening, to be able to share with them um, what choices there are and some of the implications of making the choices um, that they might be asked to be making in these meetings. And those are very special people in the world. So there are a few people like that that do accompany the um, indigenous wisdom keepers and often they are um, helping organize their logistics as they travel around the world and host their plant medicine ceremonies and share their culture. And so those people do exist and at the same time, they're often traveling. So, so yes. Um, Mm -hmm. So you you lived with uh, with the tribes in, in the Amazon and uh, you saw how they um, you saw their way of life and do you know or do you think that the elders uh, are passing their knowledge to the willing new generations or are the new generations willing to to absorb this knowledge and, and take it through the next stage in the cycle of the, of the tribe? What's really interesting is that what I've been witnessing in the years of going back to some of these communities is that there has been a remarkable indigenous cultural renaissance. And a lot of that indigenous cultural renaissance in my view and in, there, you know, there isn't enough formal documentation of this phenomenon but you can see it. And when you talk to other people that are also going back or are also accompanying the indigenous, they will also remark upon it. And then you also see it in the, the arts and the evolution of the arts and the flourishing of the textiles and the beadwork and um, the music, for example. And a lot, and so there has been a tremendous strengthening of a sovereignty, indigenous sovereignty movement that has at its core culture and that has at its core their medicine traditions. And also the alliances that have been opened up and created as a result of the expansion of plant medicines around the world and the increased interchange and travel. So more outsiders going to their village, more pages, uh, more shamans and curanderos traveling outside their communities to offer ceremonies. There's this international medicine community with a lot of movement. And as there's a lot of movement, I mean, granted a lot of it has, uh, has really subsided because of COVID, but prior to COVID, there was a lot of movement. It was increasing. And as this movement grows, there's more people that have the means 
that want to help. And most of the funding that's going to these indigenous communities are coming not from necessarily from within Brazil, for, for example, or within Peru. They're coming from people in Europe and North America. And, uh, and so some of the communities have intentionally chosen to open up their communities to receive outsiders and to intentionally cultivate relationships with people in the West, in the global North. Um, and in forging these alliances, what's coming up is strategies and friendships, friendships and strategies and collaborations on how they can continue to face some of the most challenging obstacles that they currently face that are only actually getting worse right now, especially with the current government of Brazil. Bolsonaro's government has been incredibly harsh on the indigenous people in Brazil. Yeah, I mean, you just mentioned some encouraging signs that uh, information and knowledge, in fact, not information, knowledge is being um, spread around and more people are, are willing to, to absorb it. So that's that's very good. Um, I'd like to, um, to talk about uh, Ethiopian Nation and uh, some of your um, programs. Why did you create the platform? So I originally created the platform because I wanted to interview people and, and so it launched as a podcast and then it grew into a website and then you know there were certain things that were coming up in this the space at the time and in the conversation around the globalization of plant medicines and the expansion of the ayahuasca community so that most of the people that are drinking ayahuasca these days are not indigenous and most of the people that are leading ayahuasca ceremonies are not indigenous and are predominantly white. Um, and then there was a question of, you know, how do you know who's qualified and how do you know who's leading a safe ceremony? How do you know if it's a good ceremony? How do you like, so safe, qualified and good are three different attributes that are completely different from each other and also intertwined. You can have qualified, but the person's not safe yes, yes. because they're a predator. You can have, you know, good, but they're not qualified. You know, you could have safe, but, it, you know, so it's just, um, and so that inspired me to create my first online course, which was called Spiritual Evolution with Sacred Plant Medicines. And it's a course that is really designed for people that are on the beginning stages of their exploration, want to understand what the different, what they're getting into, what safety looks like, you know, how to orient themselves within the ceremony, before, prepare before the ceremony, integrate after the ceremony. So it was designed for, um, uh, for to address some of those questions that were coming up. And then the website just continued to grow, uh, grow and then more opportunities to host events and online programs uh, based on the needs that were coming up in the space. So that was, that's kind of the, the natural evolution of Entheonation. Um, are you planning uh, to go back to South America anytime soon? Oh gosh, um, I think I'm going to need to first of all get vaccinated, um, and then <laughs> I know it's a quite a contentious debate. I, I don't want to get into a big vaccine debate on this uh, on this call. I would say it's you know obviously a very deeply personal um, decision, but I, I keep seeing people in the plant medicine community who staunchly believe that they were not going to get sick and that their spiritual light was going to protect them, get horribly sick um, and hospitalized. One person was 32. Um, the other person uh, went to Kumbamela. Um, go figure. Wow. And ended up wow. hospitalized. <clears throat> Yeah, and that person really, you know, was just like, look, everybody else, you know, can lock themselves up and then the rest of us, we're just going to go and keep the economy alive. And, you know, we're going to do our plant medicines, we're going to like vibrate, you know, high light frequency. And, you know, she ended up in the hospital. So, um, you know, fortunately, she made her, her way, you know, she made, she made it out of the hospital too many people go to the hospital and, um, and die there. So in my, you know, perspective, um, 
I would like to travel and I would get my vaccines first and then I'm going to potentially it's on my radar go to the go to Mexico for the for mushroom season in Oaxaca mm -hmm. that's what I'm looking forward to and if things open up in Brazil again Brazil's pretty bad right now so you know uh, I really would love to go back to my spiritual hub in Alto Paraíso for their Condor Eagle Festival, but they had to cancel. And um, yeah, so I don't know, I'm not sure yet. Yeah, good luck with uh, with your traveling. <clears throat> yeah, we all hope to to get back to our uh, travel uh, plans, and we'll see how that will, will pan out. Uh, Lorna, we are approaching the end of the, the interview. Any final thoughts? Yeah. Hmm. Well, I would love to share a free gift with the audience um, that uh, is a self-study workbook that is my latest uh, focus and body of work around an exploration around what decolonizing plant medicine culture looks like. So as I shared with you, uh, Claudio, that the plant medicine community is becoming overwhelmingly white, much like the, much like yoga in the West, mm -hmm. so to speak, where, you know, you don't really think about um, a, a, an Indian yogi. When you think about yoga, you think about a beautiful uh, Instagram celebrity who is skinny and fit and white. And so, so there's a lot of conversation about what it really means to create a an equitable and inclusive plant medicine space, especially on as the psychedelic renaissance continues to unfold and we are approaching decriminalization, increased decriminalization and legalization mm -hmm. of these sacred medicines. You know, what does it actually mean? to make these medicines more inclusive? And what does it mean to actually offer reciprocity back to the original cultures that have been the, the protectors of these plants and the traditions that use the, the wisdom tradition around these plants at the cost of their own lives uh, for so many centuries. And that is the um, Keys to Decolonizing Plant Medicine Culture Workbook. So I'd love to share with you the link for people to go download it. It is a workbook that focuses predominantly on understanding the core concepts around decolonization, what that means, um, what that could look like in the plant medicine community, what that could look like in the psychedelic um, sector. And it's fun, found, founded on anti-racism training and greatly inspired by Leila Sayad's um, um, book, best-selling book called uh, Me and White Supremacy, adapted for plant medicine people. Yeah. So thank well, you so much. Thank you very much for, for your gift. Thank you again for, for being here. And um, for my uh, guests, thank you for watching it, uh, share it, uh, like it. Um, get a free book of my um, free copy of my book, The Decadence of Our Souls, when you visit my website. Support me on patreon.com slash Claudine Mugan. And until next time, love and gratitude.